Hello, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Get out your King James Bible. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 38. We're going to start in verse 14. This is uh, Earthquakes Part 4. Uh, let's see. Sally is, well, I'm still, uh, I'm doing some commentary on what Sally does. Sometimes I give you a little background because uh, not everybody's read the entire Bible. Uh, I encourage people to do it. You know, uh, that's the thing. You can get an Alexander Scorby uh, King James Bible audio on CD New Testament for about 20 bucks off of Amazon, uh, you know. And then when you're going to work or at home or in the car or whatever, just pop in a CD and boom, there you go. You know, you'd be amazed at what you'll learn and how quickly. Um, so that's just my uh, take on the matter. All right, we're going to start at uh, verse 14. Ezekiel 38, verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? Uh, this, is, this is during the millennial reign of Christ. And I'll prove that in a little bit. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and Many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. And it shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come up, uh, shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, for every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Sally writes, The last passage refers to the time when Gog, Magog, and the world come against Israel, better known as Armageddon, which takes place at the very last stage of this age. Um, I believe that's the millennium. Millennium, at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Okay, that's my note. Uh, she writes, the seventh bowl of Revelation 16, uh, 17 through 21. Note that neither Gog nor Armageddon are mentioned there, but it cannot be assumed that's not what's going on. And in the same way, passages referring to the seventh and final trumpet, such as Revelation 10, uh, that's either a one or a seven, and then Revelation 11, three, and then 7 through 12, makes no mention of the rapture of the church, yet we know 
It occurs at the last trumpet. It cannot be assumed that the rapture does not happen at that time, just because it's not mentioned in every passage involving the seventh trumpet and vice versa. It is, of course, mentioned elsewhere. All right. Um, I want to go... This is my commentary on it. Uh, this is when I think it happens. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Okay, when they're talking about the dragon, the serpent, the devil and Satan, it's all the same entity, right? Uh, why is he called the old serpent? Well, I believe that old serpent had been around for a long time and was the uh, serpent in the garden of the Genesis, uh, in Genesis 3, in the garden of Eden. And there's people who tell you that, oh, Satan and the devil are not the same thing. What? And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Oh, well, they're different entities, they say. No, the Bible says, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So Satan, there's going to be a time when Satan's bound a thousand years. Verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So, Satan's going to be locked up for a thousand years in prison. Then he's going to be, a, he's, I don't know, maybe the Lord's going to let him think he escaped or let him loose or whatever. I don't know. Uh, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So, the pre-tribbers will tell you, oh, this is the tribulation saints. Uh, boy, some of them are going to be really surprised. Now, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. People, there's only two resurrections. There's the first, and then there's the second. And if you're not in the first, you're in big trouble. The second resurrection is for the, the white throne judgment. That's the wicked that are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Okay? Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Listen carefully. Here's the punchline. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. What city? Jerusalem, people. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Isn't that what we just read in Ezekiel 38 and verse 18. Yeah, I think that's it. So, uh, I, you know, so I think this is uh, talking about the, the end of the thousand year reign. All right, so, uh, verse 10. And the devil and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Um, and I saw a great white throne, 
and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Wow, we're judged according to our works. Um, our faith is, you know, what you do is predicated upon what you believe. I mean, let's face it. Somebody comes up to you and says, uh, hey, uh, lend me 20 bucks and I'll pay you next week. I mean, if you're positive, they're not going to pay you back. You probably won't loan it to them, you know? If you don't have faith that they'll pay you back, you won't loan it to them, right? But, but if you trust them and you believe them and you love them, you know, you'll give them the 20 bucks because you're confident your faith is that they'll pay you back, right? So what you do is proof of what you believe. You know, that's just the way it is. So, and they were judged every man according to their works. You know, let's face it. Even Satan has faith in God. He believes in God. Absolutely. Read James chapter 2. But his works are evil. People are going to be judged on their works. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Wow. All right, let's go back to Sally's study. That, this, that was my commentary. All right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses uh, 51 through 53, she writes, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Will not all sleep, but will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Now, my note here. How many last trumps are there? Well, in the book of Revelation, there's seven trumpets, and the seventh trump's the last one. Unless, of course, you can find an eighth one. But pre-tribbers hate that because, well, we're going to be raptured at the pre-trib -pre rapture, you know, and... You know, the, la the seventh trump's at the end of the tribulation. It's at the end. So where do they come up with, um, you know, to them the last trump? Well, you know, there's, there's more than one last trump. There's the pre-trib la last trump, and then there's the last trump at the end of the tribulation. That's their logic, people. And if you don't understand the... Um, the last trump, or the pre-trib rapture thing, uh, write me, send me a comment, and I'll be happy to send you a 10-minute study that'll prove to you that the pre-trib rapture is a lie. It was planted by Satan to, so people won't be prepared to die for their faith. Jesus died for you, people, and he died for me, and he died for all of us, and, you know, uh, 10 of the... Twelve apostles died for their faith. Stephen died for his faith. Uh, Paul died for his faith. The only apostles that didn't die for their faith was Judas Iscariot and St. John on the Isle of Patmos that wrote the book of Revelation. So, Sally writes, For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised uh, incorruptible and will be changed. Uh, for this incorruptible must clothe itself with the incorruptible and the mortal with immortality. So let me read it from the King James. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Uh, it's talking about being dead. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkle of, twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Yeah, we got to have our resurrected bodies. So, all right, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read um, 
Oh, okay. Verse 14 on. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, ah, that's the gospel, people. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins and he rose again, that's the gospel, people. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, if you're alive when the Lord returns, you're not going to be able to stop those that are dead in Christ from coming. That's basically what it's saying there. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Yeah, secret pre-trib rapture there, right? I mean, they always do. They always shout when it's a secret rapture. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Sorry, not Donald Trump, uh, but with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Listen carefully. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. We're, those that are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Uh, the dead in Christ are going to be coming down to earth in the clouds. And those of us that are alive when the Lord comes are going to go to meet them in the clouds in the air. Okay? We'll be caught up, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. People, if we're not caught up into the clouds, it's if there's another Messiah and we're not caught up in the clouds, it's the wrong Christ. Uh, so who comes first? Does Christ come first or does the Antichrist come first? I say the Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, comes before the Lord. That's my opinion. And if you're not caught up together with him, it's the wrong Christ. That's a very important point. And I've never heard a pre-trib preaching church ever teach that. Never, 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 never. So, please be careful. All right, so Sally writes, Most would agree that these two passages are the same event, but many fail to see the proper timing told to us in the Word of God, and so intent a secret trumpet of the church, with absolutely no biblical evidence to support this notion. The two witnesses are resurrected shortly before the last trumpets, Revelation 11, verses 11 through 15, an event which frightens those who see it. Wow. I love it. I love it. Now, in an earlier study on this series, uh, we covered the two witnesses and how they were killed and how they were... Um, well, Revelation 11, 11, and 12. Let's read it. The two witnesses are killed, and it says, And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, in a cloud, in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. So, Sally writes, and in the same way, this ascension is not done in secret as with other ascensions in the Bible. Um, Jesus ascended to heaven before eyewitnesses in the same way that he will return. Um, I'm going to prove that in a second. All right, in Acts chapter 1, we're going to, uh, cha uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. 
The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. He was taken up. After that he went through, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. Okay, Christ was dead and buried, crucified, dead and buried for three days, and then he rose from the grave, and then for he was seen of them for forty days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Listen carefully. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. He was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These are probably angels. I'm positive they are. Okay, so two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? In other words, why are you standing around looking up? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. They saw him go up into the clouds. When he comes back, he's going to come back with the clouds. Bingo. All right. In uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing also, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. How's that? Boom. Boom. All right. Um, all right. So let's see. All right. Sally writes, uh, uh, on the book of Acts, you know, chapter 1, what we just read. She says, this passage makes no mention of a secret return for the church. If anything, his return sounds very visible. This leaves no reason to believe that Christ returns twice, once in secret, that's contradictory to God's word. Remember what he told us of those days. Turn to Mark 13. I knew it. And Matthew 24. Those are the end time verses. Uh, let's take it. Oh, and she writes that Elijah was not taken up in secret either. <laughs> I love it, Sally. You go, girl. I love it. I, I just wish she hadn't have smoked so much. Oh, boy. You know, I smoked, uh, well, more than, more than one thing. Um, uh, I smoked cigarettes for probably 12 13, 14 years, I don't know, over 10 years, and uh, smoked other things too. Maybe that's why I'm kind of crazy, I don't know. But, uh, all right, let's take a look at Matthew uh, 24. 
All right, Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of the, those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Uh, now, if I was Satan, I would fake this. Now, there is a thing called Project Blue Beam. B-L-U-E-B-E-A-M. They are using lasers and holograms and I tell you what, some of that stuff looks really real. But that's why I tell you people, if we're not caught up into the clouds with Christ, it's the wrong Messiah. And that's why people fight Paul, because Paul warns us about all this stuff. Paul, who was trained as a Pharisee, very learned, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I've read some of Gamaliel's um, works uh, I, according to legend, he became a Christian. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Wow. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Mark 13, go there. All right, Mark 13, uh, verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory and power. Yeah, it sounds like a secret rapture, doesn't it? And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Yeah, there was a uh, guy named George Gordon that turned me on to this. Do you know that if you're flying in a plane or maybe in a space capsule going on your way to the moon or Mars, if, if that's not fake? I don't know if it is or not. I kind of think it is fake, but uh, suppose you're out in the space station, right? Nehemiah 1.9 But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven the uttermost part of the heaven, you're not on earth, you're, you're the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Wow. Can you imagine that? Um, Mark 13, 27. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his leg from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Think about it. If you're flying in a plane, <laughs> isn't that the uttermost part of heaven? God's going to gather people from all over. Pretty wild, huh? I don't know. Space travel? I don't know. All right. Uh, let's see. I guess next we're going to pick up in the... Book of Second Kings, and uh, I think we're going to end it right here. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.